we can go ahead and start if you want to. If you're ready, I'm ready. Well, let me just do this. Look, I'm the interviewer. You got to let me do this my way. Okay, but I was going to suggest the topic. Oh, go. Go ahead. I was going to suggest that we start out with, why am I doing this? Exactly. Okay, so you're on the same page there. Well, I, I turn it over to you then. First of all, I'd like you all to know that I'm speaking with Mark Burkell, a bit of a renaissance man. This is the first of several interviews that we're going to do uh, on a wide range of topics. What I'd like to do first is just give Mark an opportunity to tell you what this project is all about and what we're hoping to achieve. So, Mark, why this series of interviews? What is it that we're hoping to achieve? Okay. Well, first of all, you know, I'm in a situation where the time is a luxury that I may not have a whole lot of left. I've got uh, stage four cancer, and I'm at this point 22 months into an eight-month death sentence. I've um, come up with some very innovative ways to stay alive in the meantime. But um, I feel like the the time has come that uh, if I don't dump as much of what I know into audio or video and uh, upload my, my afterlife onto the web, that this is stuff that will be lost. And there's a serious chance that uh, that's going to happen, and it's time to uh, deal with the reality that um, this is a prudent move. My acquaintance with Mark began in 2000, so the last year of the last millennium. Uh, 2001, obviously, was the first year of this millennium. And the way that I got to know Mark is that he essentially offered me digital immortality. That is to say... He offered to host some sites of mine perpetually, that they would exist as long as there was an Internet and Mark's server farm existed, so long as I paid the ICANN to keep my sites registered, that they would exist forever. So this idea of digital immortality is not a new concept for, for you, right, Mark? This is something that you've been dealing with since you very first began the technical side of your life back in the 70s. Well, actually, back in the 70s, we barely had digital immortality. We had stuff on tape and on film, you know, in, in, in libraries that were deteriorating. And it was the early part of the computer revolution. But I would say that digital immortality would have been at least a decade later. You know, people were exchanging MP3 files and WAV files. It's funny that you should say that. So when you started building computers in the 70s in your garage, you had not even a twinkling in your eye of that it was going to lead to this situation we're in now where a gig of memory is to a person in the Western developed world, dirt cheap, right? Well, let's put it this way. In the 70s, now there, there's sort of like two instances in the 70s when I first got into computers that were separate, you know, once in around 72 and then, you know, then with modern processors in 1979. Back then, I was probably the most optimistic person on the planet that I knew of. Now, there were other people who were ahead of me on this, you know, Ray Kurzweil, for example. But I had predicted, you know, that this was it. You know, this was the computer revolution and that every business would have a computer. And then quite a few people would have one at home, you know, but those people would be the elite nerd. And that's what I was predicting and I was probably more optimistic than 99.9% .9 of everybody else. And I was probably a thousand times lower than what actually happened. Because yeah. now there are people, even in developing nations, who carry smartphones that have more computing power than the first international space station that was launched. Right. I, I remember back in the mid-70s, I used to live in a, a commune in Missouri called the Garden of Joy Blues. And they didn't have electricity there. It was a little hippie commune. And I lived in a tent in the front yard, and I got to be known as Electric Mark because I could make things run on car batteries, you know. So they had lights and music and things like that. And then when they drove to town, they would hook the battery up, and that would recharge their car battery. Back then, I had a friend of mine who I'm still in contact with named Kat. So it's now 42, 43 years later-ish. And she has more computing power in her house than the entire United States government had back then. So I just imagine going back in time and telling her, I'm Mark from the future, and you're going to own several computers that are more powerful than the FBI and the CIA and NASA put together. 
to see if she would believe it, you know. Of course not. Let me ask you a question about this series of interviews. In my acquaintance and friendship with you, you're a fairly iconoclastic personality. You've done some truly unusual things. Well, you've been in on the ground floor of some organizations that have dealt with some issues back in the 20th century that were, oh, I don't want to characterize them as fringe issues because they weren't fringe in any sense, but issues that were of interest to a, a fairly small group of people, such as your work with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, whereas now transparency, privacy, the ability of the government to monitor its people. We're recording this on uh, June 15th of 2018, and net neutrality was just undone. The rule which required Internet providers not to favor or disfavor the speeds of various kinds of content. So I guess what I'm asking you is, I don't think of you as Mark the computer guy, or Mark the politics guy, or Mark the scientific method reality guy. You're sort of a renaissance man and you've done a lot and been there at the beginning of a lot of trends that in the last century, the 20th century, would have been considered very niche marketplaces of ideas, whereas now they're ubiquitous and everybody has skin in the game. Can you talk a little bit about your biography? Well, here's the thing. One of the questions you're implying there in asking it this way is, what makes what I, I have to say worthy of this space after I'm dead? Why am I not like just everybody else who wants some form of immortality? The reason I'm doing this isn't about me. It's not about preserving Mark Burkell. But I have had experiences and I have certain talents and abilities and have figured out a lot of stuff that is worthy on its own of being passed on. So this is all about doing two things, getting certain information out that I have figured out about a very wide variety of subjects that's valuable and useful. And I'm hoping that in the process of getting this out, there's something that's a little different about the way I think and the way I reason. And I haven't figured out a way to even understand that or explain why am I different from most people problem that's been there all my life. So I'm thinking that maybe the best way of exposing that in a way that somebody could reverse engineer in a way that I can't seem to do by going through my ideas and how I came up with it, that somehow people will learn how I think and be able to replicate that. And not only for certain thoughts that I have to become immortal, but that my actual method of thinking can somehow be passed on. There's a couple of things that come to mind hearing you talk about this. One is the oft-repeated phrase of standing on the shoulders of giants. Right. Hawking stood on Einstein's shoulders, who stood on Newton's shoulders, that kind of thing. Right. So Kennedy grabbed for a higher and higher knowable reality. Yeah. So not only are you putting your shoulders out there for people to stand on, what you're also putting out there is your process. Yes. Right? That's, in fact, the process, if I can somehow get that into word, is more important than everything else put together. Because if you have the process, you can figure out the rest of the stuff using the same process that I use. You can only apply your process to a finite number of things. Well, I have, you know, I'm one person. Yes. Yeah. I wish that they could clone me, you know, and make a thousand copies, put me online and let people download me. But the let me, technology let me just, for that isn't there yet, you know, so the best I can do is, is what, to do it by audio. Looking back at your life, obviously, I know something about your interests, the things that you tend to spend time on. Has there been any area of your life that you think this process would be well suited to applying that you haven't had the time or the interest to apply it to, that you would like to see someone grab that topic and run with it using your process? If people learn my process, they could literally apply it to any problem that no, exists. I get that. Again, you're one man, finite yeah. amount of time, finite amount of problems, issues, topics, interests that you can apply your process to. If you, and I know I'm putting you under pressure here because I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but is there one area one topic, one subject matter that you think to yourself, the process that I'm trying to teach people to engage in, I wish that I had had the interest or the time or the inclination to apply it to X. What is that X, that one thing? I well, mean, some people get to the end of their lives and say, I wish I had learned a foreign language. I wish I had gone through psychotherapy. 
Yeah, I understand the question. So the answer to that is what I'm doing now. I have not been able to figure out the process for which I think and be able to talk about it in an educational framework. And that's the answer to your question is since I failed to do that, I'm just going to put the results out there and comment as much as possible about how I came to the result and then let somebody who's smarter than I am, perhaps, reverse engineer that and understand the process that led to me being able to come up with the things I've accomplished. What makes you think if we do this right, that you're not going to have a moment of insight? As you walk me through the process as it's applied to various subjects, what makes you think that you're not going to have a moment of insight when you say, okay, this is what I've been doing all along? That may, in fact, happen. In fact, I'm hoping that in this discussion that I have that moment of insight in real time and can just blurt it out there and say, this is it. I'm going to grab your hand and I'm going to walk you backwards. How did it all start? When and where were you born? Tell me a little bit about your family and your schooling. I was born in 1955 in Wheeling, West Virginia. Were you the oldest, the youngest, middle child? Oldest of three. I know you have a brother and a sister. Did you start school in Wheeling or somewhere else? No, I went to uh, school entirely in Wheeling, West Virginia, from kindergarten to uh, high school, which I did graduate. I'm a high school graduate, in case somebody wants to hire me because of that. You know, I have never had a job where somebody asked me if, if I had graduated high school. <laughs> so how'd you do in school? Terrible. Did you enjoy it, the process? No. Were there teachers that you found inspirational or interesting? Maybe two or three, possibly. And what kind of subjects did they teach? One teacher that I really liked, and unfortunately she died of leukemia during the year, she was a biology teacher, Mrs. Lowe, and she taught at Tridelphia High School. Other than that, I had no good teachers. So there was no, like, for instance, I'll tell you that when, um, when I took algebra for the first time, I took it as part of an accelerated track, so most people took it in ninth grade, and we started algebra earlier than that, the group of kids that I was part of. And when we started replacing letters with numbers, uh, numbers with letters, I got extremely excited because I saw that essentially I, I saw math in a totally new way. When, when other people were freaked out about word problems, I thought they were the most fun thing in the world because all of a sudden math meant something. I, it it could be used to figure out answers to really cool questions. You never had a moment like that in math or in science or in oh, history uh, or political sciences? Yeah. Yeah, math is, you know, math and science are, like, really, really cool. I've always, you know, been into math and science. You know, as, 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 long as, I can, as long as I can remember, before I went to school, I was into math and science. Yeah, me too. So yeah. that's something we have in common. So, okay, so you leave high school. You've got your shiny new diploma under your arm. Uh -huh. uh, you you didn't excel. You weren't um, you weren't enchanted by the experience. Let's say. What did you do next? My mother married some jerk from Michigan, and we all moved up there, bumfuck nowhere outside of Richmond, Michigan. But we were in the country, and I got thrown out a few months later and ended up in, living on my own in St. Clair, Michigan, fixing CB radios for a living. It would have been 1973. Before everybody went crazy for CB. No, that, that was during. People were definitely crazy for CB radios. During well, I'm, I'm thinking of Burt Reynolds movies like Convoy. Right, yeah. Well, Mark was born in 55. I was born in 66. So I remember the CB craze. Breaker, yeah. Breaker, 1-9, Good Buddies. I knew like slang for cops and slang for, you know, I got your 21 and, you know, speed traps. And my dad had a CB radio that he you let got, us. You got the Mr. Fix that world's greatest CB radio repairman. CBs were sort of cell phones before cell phones were cell I mean, I don't even know how to tell a millennial what a CB is. CB is basically you hop on the radio waves right. and talk to other people on the radio. Yeah, it's a transmitter, fairly limited number of miles, depending on, you know, the, the more people get on, the more limited it is. Oh, they're all talking at the same time on the same channel to share information about road conditions, you know. And law enforcement. Well, the road conditions includes law enforcement and whether or not the scales are open. Or you mostly did repairs for truckers. You didn't do a lot of home CB enthusiasts. In different jobs, I worked 
doing electronic repair on a wide variety of uh, electronic equipment. But there were times when uh, one of my CB radio jobs was working at a truck stop fixing CB radios in a CB radio shop. So it was truckers would come in. I'd fix the radios while they waited, kept them all entertained while they stood in line and get them out the door so they can get back on the road. This, I guess, affinity you had for repairing mechanical and, and, I mean, I don't want to say electronic because we're going back to CB radios and transistor radios and things like that, which is very different from what we think of as modern electronics. Did you take some sort of vocational education in mechanical engineering or anything like that in high school that made you primed for this or what got you into this career? I was completely self-taught. And what made you decide to self-teach yourself that one particular thing? At first, I was mostly into pure mathematics when secondary into electronics. There came a time when I exceeded the abilities of everybody around me who knew everything about mathematics. I knew everything they knew, and then some. I got to thinking, well, what kind of a job can I get working brain teasers the rest of my life? When at the time, I thought nothing, you know, although it turns out that there's plenty of jobs for mathematicians out there these days. But it was a world that I had not envisioned at the time. And that's when I switched over to electronics. And at the time, I reasoned that if I could fix a television set, I will always be employed for my whole life if I'm willing to go back and fix TV sets while I'm waiting for the next opportunity to come along. And for several decades... Is that your left-handed way of saying that the American consumer is addicted to television? No, I knew, I knew that you know everybody had a television, and televisions broke down and needed fixed. And at the time, I assumed that televisions were always going to be expensive, or it wasn't going to be a throwaway item like it is today. Television goes bad, people throw it away and run out of Best Buy and get another one, a better one than the one they had. It's a, if the TV goes bad, it's an opportunity to upgrade. But at the time, that's what I thought, because I knew that I didn't have parents that were going to send me to college, and I was going to be out in the world taking care of myself, but I needed something that I could always get a job doing minimally. So how'd you transition from CBs to TV? Well, I actually went the other way. I actually started with television and ended up with CB radios a couple years later. Home electronics, TV sets, stereos, 8-track tape players, if you remember those. I do. Record players, turntables. Yes. It's a lot of turntables. We had cassette, we had 8-track, we had reel-to-reel. Right. Amplifiers, tube amps. I worked on a lot of tube equipment. It took quite a while for televisions to switch over from tube to transistor. And until flat screens came out, you always had the cathode ray tube and a horizontal sweep oscillator often was a tube as well. So, you know, the TV that I have right now is my first television that wasn't a CRT, cathode ray tube. Right. And I've had this TV for a while. I'm, I'm one of those people that keeps it till it breaks. I don't right. upgrade unless it breaks. I'm cheap. But um, let me ask you something because this is... Uh, it didn't occur to me to ever ask you this before, but right now when people want someone to work on their computer that goes bad or whatever, they go to some place like Geek Squad, right, that is licensed and bonded and insured and this and that. You and I grew up at a time when you could kind of hang out a shingle and do whatever you wanted to. You made your reputation, and that was your license, right? Right. You were required to be licensed by the state to poke around inside somebody, under somebody's hood or inside somebody's TV set. But it's a very different world now where people expect to, you know, they want to see your license and they want to see your certificate of completion that you're, for instance, you're not MS, are you MSC? Are you a Microsoft software development engineer? No. Nope. Certified? Nope. Not certified in anything. I once got certified in Red Hat Linux. Right. I remember when you were first doing Red Hat. I remember that. I worked for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. For some reason, I decided I want to get certified. I want to take the test and see if, you know, I'm worthy of this. That was in the 90s? No, that was in 2002. Back in the early 80s, in 1984, I opened a computer store. I started out selling Morrow uh, Design CPM computers. And then evolved forward to Leading Edge, which was an IBM clone. And then shortly after that, I started making my own computers out of parts. You know, you'd get a case from one place and a power supply and a motherboard and a video card and a hard disk drive and hard disk controller and floppy drives. And you put it all together 
and put a screen and a keyboard on it and and got bought a copy of DR DOS and you had a computer system. Where was this business at? Are you still in Michigan? No, this is in Springfield, Missouri. Now we're to the mid eighties and you've got your computer business. At what point during this process did you finally figure out that you were doing something unique in the way that you were approaching problems? That's an interesting question. Well, I, I, I had always, you know, in, in my life, you know, to different degrees, realized that I was smarter than most people around me. When I was four years old, I realized that I was smarter than my parents. And that started when I, I took apart a flashlight to figure out how it worked. I wanted to have the batteries, the bulb out and be able to make the light bulb light up just holding the batteries in the bulb. So I put the two batteries on top of each other and put the bulb on top and it did not light up. And it took me several hours before I finally figured out that there was a connection that went from the spring on the bottom of the flashlight through the shell of the flashlight, through the switch on the side, up to the the, light bulb thread. Yeah. Yeah. So I took three kitchen knives and bridged it, and it lit up. And I figured it out, and I went to show my parents that I could not make them understand what I'd just done. At that point, I realized these people are my parents. I'm four years old, and they don't understand how a flashlight works, and they're incapable of understanding it when I explain it to them. I think it's safe to say that anybody listening to this can understand what you're saying. The the spring that touches the negative end of the battery, right, the flat flat ass part of the battery, not the pokey part. Right. That that spring touches the negative end of the battery, and that the threads, that, that are touching the light bulb are also touching the positive end of the battery. And it's that link from the negative end of the battery to the threads on the light bulb that has to be a closed circuit in order for it to get power, right? Right, yeah, that's cause, that causes it to flow. Yeah, you know? but you've, got to, you've got to close the circuit. You've got to let the power get to where it's going, which is the bulb. Now, I think most people listening to this can understand that. You're saying your parents couldn't. Why do you think that is? Do you think you were explaining it poorly or they were just thinking that a flashlight was an entirely more magical object than it actually They they didn't want to learn it. Okay. There we go. That's what I was hoping you would say. If they weren't interested, they weren't going to turn on the learning circuit inside their brain. Exactly. And this is what I wanted to get us to. Something that um, I think you and I have in common is a genuine enjoyment of our own curiosity. Right. Right. Yeah, well, that that is part of it. You know, you got to want it. You got to want to know. You know, you got to have every fiber of your being wants to understand everything that's going on around you. There has to be a a joy in the finding out that there's something you don't know and the joy of the anticipation of getting to the right answer. Yeah, uh, find out something new. How does this work? I'd be taking apart old clocks and watches and things that people have thrown away to mess with you know i wanted to, i wanted to know how it worked to have this little spring gear thing rocks back and forth and it, it was just fascinating so i'm always asking questions of course how's this work how's this work and of course my parents were you know, annoyed because they didn't know the answers to any of this stuff and they really didn't even want to find out and there are a lot of people that are like that yeah, most people are like that. Time. And I can't understand why people don't want to know things, why they really understand how stuff works. It's been my experience that there are a lot of people who want to be entertained and distracted, who having to think hard about a hard question or a complicated issue is not a joy for them. Yeah. They derive no entertainment value or enjoyment at all from the process. Yeah. Right? There are yeah. other people who want to be stumped, want their brain to be teased. I I guess it's the difference between people who watch The Price is Right and people who watch Jeopardy, right? People who watch Jeopardy are going to be exposed to questions they don't have the answer to, right? Right. They're going to find out what they don't know and be excited because they learned something that they didn't know. Other people find it. The idea of being told that you don't know something, they find that very discomforting, right? I have no idea what that level of experience is like. I have always been curious, and I want to know everything. And and, and, and the idea that other people don't want to do that is somewhat hard to even conceive when it comes right down to it. 
And that's what makes me different than most people. You set out to explain something to somebody. Let's say that when you were little, little, you ran up to your mom and you said, Mom, Mom, I just figured out how a flashlight works. Look at this. And you start to set out your kitchen utensils and your little display. And the first thing out of your mom's mouth is, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to know about all that. I don't want to fool around with all, I don't, just put that together and go put it away. Yeah, they, did, they didn't actually say that, which was, you know, what might, might have made things a little different. They actually kind of looked like they were pretending to follow what I was saying, you know, but it, they, they might have just been fake listening or something, but they gave me the idea that they were actually paying attention to me and what I had to tell them and couldn't understand it, you know. So I'm not entirely sure that it was that they were just not interested. I think that they were had, are so habitually not interested that they lost their ability to understand stuff. The concept of the brain as a muscle, that if you stop losing it long enough, it no longer yeah. makes a connection. They, they didn't use it and they lost it. They were no longer learning anything new. They could look at the news and see new things and talk about new things that they just saw in the news. But the idea of actually understanding and not just parroting back what they saw, you got to do that. You have to make the brain think it through. You're talking about analysis. You're talking about rote memorization versus analysis, right? Yeah, but the ability to understand what's going on, not just memorize it or not memorize it. So understanding why the right answer is correct. Yes. And being able to analyze why the right answer is correct. Yeah, when you understand something, then you can use that in situations that are not identical to what you were exposed to. So that way, if the problem in the real world is a little different than the problem that you learned from the school book, if you understand it, you're going to be able to deal with the problem in the real world. If you just memorized it for a test, you're going to have no idea what to do. So it sounds like what we're talking about here is critical thinking. It's not just critical thinking. <laughs> it's the desire to want to be a critical thinker. Just your personal experience, what percentage of people do you think are versed in and comfortable with critical thinking as a personal activity? The the short answer is I have no idea. The, The longer answer is too damn few, which is probably the most accurate answer. And I would say well under 10%. And everybody else is just sitting in front of the TV eating sugar. Being told what to think. They're just being programmed. It's not even like they are told and they say, oh, I'm going to think that. Just going right in. I want to get to a place where we can understand when you first sense you were exceptional. Now, you said when you were four years old, you knew that your parent, that you were exceptional in comparison to your parents. When did that knowing that you were exceptional become a more global concept for you where you said, okay, it's not just my parents, it's not just my brother and sister. I'm different than most people. Being that I I was born in Wheeling, West Virginia, my parents never took me anywhere. I mean, literally hadn't gotten more than 200 miles from home since the day I was born until the day I was 17. So my world was a small world and I had no concept of world in any real sense as a child. So I I really didn't think that. uh, All I knew was that in a lot of ways, I was very different than anybody who I'd ever met. But I kind of assumed that, you know, in other places, there are more people who are like me. There are, but those are really rare. At the time when I was young, I had no concept of that. Knew from civics class and geography class in school that West Virginia wasn't exactly the, the bastion of intellectual advancement. So I just assume that there's people at Harvard and Yale and, and Stanford and MIT. Yes, you know, and you know the the people who work at NASA, you know, went to the smart people out there. They're just in places where the smart people hang out. And Wheeling, West Virginia, wasn't one of them. That's what I thought, you know. Um, I don't really think that there's anything about me biologically that's that different than anybody else. There's a lot of mental processes that I'm just not good at. You in, know, in the kind of world that I would envision, I would still be significantly above average. I'd just be in the top 10 to 20 percent and not really any better than that. People who are like super, super geniuses being 
way up there, way ahead of me. And there, there are some of those out there. Certainly, I'm not on the same league as uh, Elon Musk. You said earlier that there are some mental processes that you feel like you have not mastered or that you don't have a particularly good personal process to do. I have some uh, reading disabilities. I can read, but it's difficult. Most people would call it dyslexia, but my thought patterns are more in tree form than in linear form. Reading is very linear. I find myself reading and thinking about something else at the same time, and I'll get to the couple paragraphs in and realize that I read all that. I retained none of it because I was thinking about something else. To what you were reading. Yes. I have no artistic skills. To make my handwriting legible takes a major amount of work. You can't draw anything. I mean, Are you a good dancer? Uh, I am not too bad. Are you athletic? Um, no, I mean, I, I'm not in any types of sports. And I used to be more athletic than I am now, you know. I, I'm not at the bottom of that. I keep myself reasonably fit. I can lift more weight than most men my age. I was hauling wheelbarrows of heavy clay from a garden that I'm putting in down to the creek. I, I want to see if I can zero, a, zero in on the moment when you realize that the way that you do things is different than the way that other people do things, okay? You, so when you were four, you realized that you had an intellectual curiosity that had to do with understanding the way things work, literally. I'm not really realizing that I'm super smart. I'm realizing that the rest of the world is just plain stupid. Here's a question for you. These truckers at the CV uh, stop, at the at the truck stop where the CV repair shop was, where... You basically did like the the fast food version of CB repair, right? They drive in. Yeah, you know, while they wait, you know. Did you ever question why these truckers who were so dependent on this technology to do their job and do it well weren't able to fix their CBs, but you were? They never got into electronics. It was more an affinity and an interest than an aptitude. I mean, I, I guess I had the aptitude because it was something I was interested in, and. And therefore, I put a lot of time into learning it, learning it well. I built things, you know. I measured currents and voltages and, and different components. I understood what every single component did at deep level. Of course, repair itself is an interesting skill in itself. There are, are, are people out there who did electronic repair and were very good at it, who understood virtually nothing about electronics. And But they have developed the skills to diagnose, and they had methods and rules, and they had a service manual, and they had a telephone where they could call the people at the factory, and they got things fixed. But I was somebody who you know went to the trouble to try to understand everything on a very deep level, so that when they, you come across the one that nobody else can fix, that's the one that they gave to me, and I could fix stuff that nobody else could fix. And it was because of skills that I had developed, you know, that I learned because I was, you know, trying to, I was into electronics. I wanted to learn everything about it and the math behind capacitance and inductance and how oscillators work. So what I want to get to and what I'm trying to, I keep trying to nudge you with my nose into one spot, which is we're born in 55. So right. this is when transistor radios were a thing, right? Well, no, in 55, there was no transistor radio. So the transistor was invented, I believe, in 1943, and they played with it. You know, in the in the 60s, they had the little cheap five transistor radios. So let's say 60s would be when you were, you know, 10-ish, let's say, by the mid-60s. Yeah. By the time I was born, transistor radios were a thing. You knew how to fix that. CB radios, which are shortwave, Right. Did you ever work on ham radios, anything like that? Yes, I worked on radios of all different frequencies and power. Right. You know, so I yeah. Guess, I guess what I'm trying to get to is the part where all of these things that you were able to fix and these computers that you were able to build, when you realized the computer revolution was coming, you foresaw that computers were going to be ubiquitous in business use and that on the personal level that elites would also have access to this, to this power. Right. Um, you did not foresee the personal computer and the personal cell phone being something that even people of very modest or working class people would be able to afford to to have. Well, there was no such thing as a personal cell phone back in those days. Right. No, mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is to decide to go into, and I don't know that you ever made a 
a conscious decision, but your life has sort of tracked <laughs> the Industrial Revolution, right? If you think of the pinnacle of the Industrial Revolution being the assembly line creating affordable machinery for people to own, like even middle, even working class families can afford a dishwasher and a blender and a toaster oven and a refrigerator, right? If you see the Industrial Revolution's peak as being the machines that simplify daily living become available and affordable to working class, not middle class, but working class people, right? Right. Your life kind of tracks the TV in every home wasn't a thing that happened until you were born. Right. right? It was the mid-50s. And then the mid-60s, everybody had a little radio that they could carry with them everywhere, right? Right. And by the mid-70s, Everybody had a turntable and a cassette or, or a track and a, a receiver. And I mean, when I talk to people about music now, people that are younger than me can't, when I talk about having a music room, they don't understand what I mean. What I mean is we had a receiver and a reel to reel and an eight track and speakers and woofers and tweeters. And now you just have a bar. And that's a speaker that does all those things, right? Right. And fractionates all of those frequencies of sound. Right. You don't need a receiver and you don't need a tape player because you just have your drive that has all of your your iPod or whatever. But essentially, I'm looking at your life and you when you were born, the TV was ubiquitous in, work, in, in every home, even working class homes. By the mid-60s, the radio is ubiquitous. Right. The transistor radio, the portable, not the big thing that people sat next to to listen to FDR talk. Yeah, well, those things had too. In the living room. But by the 70s, pretty much everybody has everything, and then the computer revolution starts to take hold. It starts first in government and in large businesses. But by the 80s, personal computers are a thing, and you're on the leading edge of that. Right. Right? Right. I guess what I'm asking is, was it the right place in the right time, or was it the right man in the right time? First of all, I always wanted to be in the computers, you know, and it was frustrating that I couldn't just go get one. And then when it came to the time that I could, you know, which was 1979 when I got my first real computer, I mean, yeah, I could see it coming because this thing was just going to get better and better and cheaper and cheaper and do more things. Uh, saying, uh, which I, I, I turn around, is that invention is the mother of necessity. They invent the thing, and then everybody's got to have one. So, yeah, I saw that coming. And even at that, you know, I way, way underestimated it. And I was you know, among the most optimistic people. Let's talk about some big ideas. Okay. okay. What was your first big idea that you realized when you had it was the big idea? Well, that's an interesting question. Because it all depends on what you consider to, to be a, a big idea. I had a number of outstanding ideas that a lot well, of people me, might consider big. But my biggest idea was the Church of Reality. Well, let me yeah. let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Somebody has to be the first person to think of something, right? There has to be a first person who said chocolate and peanut butter will taste good together, right? right. Peanut butter cups don't grow on trees. Somebody had to think of that. Right. Um, I often go back to the example of the most American of all. Uh, apple pies are fine and all of that, but I think the most American of all dessert food, foods is the chocolate chip cookie. The okay. chocolate chip cookie was invented during the Depression as a way to stretch chocolate, right? Okay. It's like, well, if we make chocolate chips and put them in cookies, it's not a lot of chocolate, but people can afford to buy the cookie and get a little bit of chocolate. I consider it to be the most American That's brilliant. Dessert. That's brilliant. Right? Yeah. Somebody had a great idea. And the great idea was, we're just going to, and people can't afford to buy a chocolate bar. They just can't. So we're going to chop a chocolate bar up into little chips. We're going to put a few, few of those chips in the cookie. We're going to bake up the cookie. People will get a taste of chocolate in the cookie. And it has survived. There are as many varieties of chocolate chip cookies now. I mean, it's just... Literally, right. you could play the alphabet game with chocolate chip cookies, right? You could easily do that. But right. what I'm saying is, in my life, I've had some good ideas. My 
first really great idea was integrating the flagpole at my, my elementary school, right? I've told you the story before. Right. I was a yeah. Girl Scout, go to the elementary school, see the Boy Scouts raising the flag, go to the principal and say, hey, I'm on the Girl Scouts color guard. Can we raise the flag next? No, only boys get to do that. I decided I didn't like that petition, et cetera. I win. Girls will raise the flag. Yay, I integrate the flagpole. Right. I had a good idea. Yeah. I don't believe for a second that I was the first Girl Scout color guard member who ever looked at the flagpole and said, it's not fair that we don't get to do that. Yeah, but you're the one who made it happen. Right. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, during your what wait, when you look back at your life, what was your first really good idea? It may not be anything that sounds like a great idea to somebody in 2018, but when you thought of it, it was a great idea. And you realize, this is something that people always think about doing. Well, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of, you know, you know, when you say my first one, you know, and I, I don't have, um, you know, a story like yours, you know, that goes back that young. Let's go at it from a different angle. What do you remember being the first truly awful idea that you rejected? I think I, I looked at, you know, look forward to school with, with dread, you know, where everybody else was looking at it with excitement, you know, and that was, was that sort a of thing. Uh, no, no, not social. It was more like I looked at schools as an extension of the military, and they were going to brainwash, try to brainwash me into being somebody different than who I am. I mean, I, I remember having thinking that, that when I was let's three talk. years old. Let's let's talk about that because that's interesting. Um, education and indoctrination. Okay, I was. I told you before that I was fortunate that my parents taught me that respect was earned, that you don't respect somebody just because they're, right. or just because they wear a policeman's uniform or just because they have pastor in front of their name. Right. Person will behave in a way that earns your respect or not. But your respect is your, it's your property. You decide who you give it to. Right. No title to it. It's your property. Okay. It sounds to me like at the age of three, you looked at the people around you and saw people not being educated, but being indoctrinated and changed and perhaps flattened out in a way that made you anxious about retaining your identity. There, there was this thing where it seemed like everybody thought wrong and that they were going to try to and they were going to try to make me think like them. So you thought they were going to get inside of your head and make you less than you are. Yeah, that they were going to break me, you know, like they break all little children into becoming zombies of the state, something like that. That's yeah. an awfully mature thought for a three-year-old to have. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Pretty weird. First thing I question is false memory. Did I actually think of that at a much older age and then thought that I thought of that at three, you know, and that would be a very common thing. But I, I do specifically remember because my grandmother had taught me mathematics, so I understood math. And I remember calculating the number of years and the age I would be when I got out of school. And I would be free again to play in the street like a child, which was what I considered what normal people did when I was so, three years old. At three years old, your personal autonomy was already something that you were guarding. Yes. And you, you know, saw... Now, when I say three, it's probably like late part of three going on, you know, four to five in that range. Sure, where school was looming. Yeah, it was right, you know, when um, the threat of being forced to go to kindergarten was coming upon me. I remember uh, that experience. I remember the first day that they walked me over there, and I was terrified. And, and this was uh, a kindergarten that was just half a day. We're talking 9 to 12. I got along with the other kids. There wasn't any problem there, but I still felt like that they were going to, at some point, force me to become somebody other than who I am. And, you know, over the years, there were times when they did, they did try to do that, and they were me, not successful. Let me, ask, let me ask you this. A lot of millennials, younger people, I'm Gen X, you're baby boomer, um, there's a concept called helicopter parenting which is children who have no unstructured time. Their parents book them. They have classes and play dates and lessons and study periods. And basically, children who have 
this concept of what's called a helicopter parent, always hovering, always structuring, always, you know, the kid has always got a million things to do to stay out of trouble. Um, me, for me growing up, and I don't know what your experience was like, when school was not happening, essentially it was free playtime. Right. If we sat in front of the TV too long, my mother would say, you kids get out from in front of that TV and go outside and play. Right. My mom always worked outside the home. Once we were in school, my mother was working outside the home. So we would come home from school and there would be chores that we had to do. But the rule was chores and homework before playtime. And it was that unstructured. And right. we had to come to our parents. My sister had to say, I want to take piano lessons. And I had to go to my parents and say, I want to take dance lessons. My parents didn't push us to do anything. Chores, homework, and the rest of your time is your own. But it sounds to me like your parents gave you a certain level of freedom that you felt like school threatened. Is that right? Well, I wouldn't call what my parents gave me as freedom. I would say that it had freedom-like properties because they basically let us just run and do whatever we were doing. And as long as we came home, that was just time that they had that they didn't have to deal with us. At my house, the rule was when the street lights come on, you better be home, right? I didn't see it as my parents not wanting me around or being neglectful. I saw it as them trusting me to be responsible for myself. Well, you had parents that were different than my parents. Back when when I was married and was raising my ex-wife's daughter, the, the little princess, I actually thought that a lot of the autonomy that I had was actually a good idea. And I gave her opportunities to make her own decisions and to control her own behavior without me having to explain in detail what I expected. The right. part of her job was to learn how to be self-sufficient and that she was supposed to know what the right thing to do was and then do the right thing. And in exchange for that, she would have freedom and autonomy. As long as you're good, you know, and I don't mean perfect, but you're good and you keep out of trouble, then we're not going to give you any rules. You figure out the rules, and it's your life. How'd that work out? It, it, it worked out really well, actually, because she was very well behaved. She did figure out what the right things to do was. We had long talks about different circumstances that she would run into, the right way to handle things. You know, we pretty much knew most of everything important that she was up to. And she came home at a reasonable time. And if she was going to be late, she called and let us know. You know, there came a point, you know, when she was like 14, 15, where my uh, ex-wife wanted to impose some rules, and I stood up and defended her, and I said, hey, we made a deal, and she's kept her end of the bargain. She's behaved, and, you know, I don't think we should impose rules on her because she's earned the right not to have them, and it prevailed. You know, the little princess grew up without the imposition of rules, but I, I, she wasn't free the same way I was free. I mean, I was in a lot of ways, totally free and where I could do bad things and I had to figure out on my own that I have a future and bad behavior leads to bad consequences and that I was really working without a net, that I had to make the right choices or I would not grow up to be a happy guy. What you're talking about is autonomy with guidance. Yes. You gave her an underpinning of a certain ethical underpinning of guidance and well, let her find the right answers, whereas your parents didn't give you any guidance. Well, I mean, one of the things I would do is also make her want to do the right thing. So, you know, we would be out and about, you know, at a grocery store and, you know, there'd be some young mother with a screaming kid in the cart, you know, freaking out, you know, and the mother can't control. And I point to that and say, you know, see that, you know, birth control. And I, I told her that before she even knew what birth control was, because I wanted to, you know, you know, would set it, you know, show people, okay, this is, you know, what somebody who's successful looks like. Here's what somebody who is unsuccessful looks like. And, you know, with people who smoke cigarettes and they're poor and they're drunk and they're, you know, nasty and because they've made bad choices in their life that has led to bad outcomes. You know, people go to jail, they commit crimes, they have no money. You know, they have lots of children out of wedlock that they have to take care of by themselves. And those are sort of the burdens of, you know, making bad decisions. So I would point these things out to her so that when she made her decision, you know, she would be in the context of, you know, what kind of life do I want? You know, do I want to be happy or do I want to be miserable? Oh, 
Well, I think I want to be happy, so I'll do the the, yeah, the smart thing rather than the dumb thing, you know. It sounds like you were acquainting her with consequences rather than saying, these are the rules because I say so. Right, yeah. No, I wanted her to understand how to come up with the right solution. You know, this wasn't memorizing Mark's arbitrary rules. You know, this right. was and the great thing about that her own rules because she figured out what the right thing to do is. You know, and the and thing could, about that is when she's confronted with something that you two haven't discussed specifically. Right. She can figure it out on the fly. Yes. And that's what I'm talking about, you know. That's what I mean by analysis. Right. In in our conversations that we're going to have as we talk about different ideas, I want to talk about the analysis part of it. Right. Um, just a personal opinion of mine. I believe that it is a mistake that we don't require... I don't know if we need formal logic training in schools. I don't know if if that's the answer, but I feel like critical thinking needs to be a subject that is taught in school. Critical thinking, how to analyze, how to tell good information from poor information, reliable information from unreliable information, how to tell a conclusion from an absolute rock-solid conclusion from a preponderance of the evidence a possible conclusion. How to know when you're there and how to know when you're not. Right. These are, you know, fairly complex ideas, but they can be taught. I, I think, you know, critical thinking should be the core of education. I that agree. Should be, that should be the first thing that they teach is how to, how to learn and how to learn the right thing. And how to figure out the good stuff and the from the and bad stuff, the you know. And by the way, how to have the confidence to do that? Because the fact is, not every kid is going to have the confidence to take apart something electrical that can shock them. Right? Well, and the, or or even point out, you know, that the the, the the teacher has made a mistake. That is a topic for another day. But I I believe that one of the great injustices that is done to students is that they are told that their teachers have the answers. <sighs> Because that puts an unfair expectation on the teachers. Well, right? you know, I'm trying. I'm thinking back and trying to think if I was ever actually told that, or if I just made that assumption on my own. My parents, like I said, were unusually fabulous, and one of the things that they taught me is nobody has all the answers. Human knowledge moves so quickly that a teacher can tell you something that they honestly believe is correct, but we found out something new that they don't know. And so you can't expect any person to have all the right answers. Well, I suppose in my case that since I figured out that my parents weren't smart enough to understand the flashlight, that that sort of like demoralized me as far as trusting older people and assuming that they're correct just because they're older than me or or professional. So I never had the expectation that the teacher was always right. Uh, But I did have the expectation that the teacher was mostly right and should be competent in the field that he or she were teaching. Unless they're coaching against sport. Well, I was never really part of that world very much. No, I'm just saying in my schools growing up, the coaches had to teach academic courses. Oh, okay. And man, oh man, did they suck. Man, oh man, did they not know anything about the courses that they taught him. Yeah, I remember, I think, had a science teacher who was a coach, and uh, he was, uh, you know, not, I don't remember anything that I learned in his class. I want to do a little teaser here. You brought up earlier the Church of Reality. Yes. This is something that came along fairly late in your life. Well, in the last 20 years. What was the first stirring in your consciousness that eventually became the Church of Reality? Just set the scene. Where are you? Who are you with? I'm, I think it's 88. Sitting in my living room, I'm smoking a joint. I'm thinking about religion. And that's the moment that it hit me. You're smoking a joint alone in your living room in Springfield, Missouri. You have a moment of insight. I don't want you to say exactly what you thought, but I want you to tell me what your emotional reaction to the thought was. Well, what was astounding was it was such an obvious idea that I couldn't believe. I, You know, the first thing was, I have never heard of this before. This is really, really obvious, and I can't be the first one to come up with this. That's what I was thinking. So your initial thought was, i got to figure out who's on this because I can't be the first. 
Yeah, I thought, you know, okay, so this is pre-Google. Oh, 1998, I think, was the year. So that'll be 20 years, you know, come this November. It will be 20 years. So they had Yahoo, and the next morning I looked it up on, you know, Yahoo, and there was no Church of Reality or anything like it. So I registered the domain name, and that was the official birth of the Church of Reality. That's how it all started. What we're going to talk about in the next interview is going to be that Yahoo search and domain name registration on a morning in November of 1998. And uh, November 7th, 1998. November 7th. It's among the many things that justify these ideas being archived. And it's not about me. This is all about the concepts. People listen to the concepts, think about the concepts, figure out where I'm right, figure out where I'm wrong. But I'm on to something here with this thing. Reality is important. And we're going to get into that. We're going to talk all about reality itself. Even maybe where does reality come from? And we're know? going to have to spend a little bit of time talking about language. We use words in a very specific sense. Right. Words that have a lot of connotations we use in a very specific sense. Yes, the um, language of reality. Uh, until next time. Mark, I leave it to you to sign off. Okay. Well, this has been fun, and uh, let's uh, wrap this up, get on YouTube, and uh, do some more. And how we talk to each other. Uh -huh. Let them know a little bit about you and your background. Right. We're going to jump into the Church of Reality tomorrow. and. We're